Hello, I can see that we've got some folks joining in with us now. Thank you very much. And thank you for spending some time in what I imagine was the waiting room. It's always a little bit strange when we're um, dwelling in digital spaces <laughs> and can't quite see what's going on. So um, I can see we've got lots of folks coming in now and that uh, number is going up. Welcome um, to this special webinar. I think we'll get straight into it because we've got um, a pretty full and exciting schedule. So before we get started, I'd like to begin by recognizing the traditional owners of the lands we're on as we're connecting today. And I note that we're not all connected in a single place. So for me and others here who are on campus today, we're on Ngunnawal and Nambri land here in Canberra. And I acknowledge the uh, Nambri and Ngunnawal elders, both past and present. I also welcome and would like to extend respect and regard to folks who are joining us from many First Nations in Australia and also around the world. Um, many of you attendees will be on the lands of other nations and we have very many in Australia. And in this way, we can recognize both the diversity between nations and the shared struggle for sovereignty. And for anyone who's an international listener, and I suspect there might be a couple, who are joining in either now or looking at the recording later on, might not be familiar with the context here in Australia. And one of the reasons that we make these acknowledgements is that in this country, the First Nations never ceded sovereignty of their lands, yet we have no treaty. So thank you very much for joining us for this special panel as part of our Read Research Notes webinar series. Uh, this webinar and the series is hosted by the Resources, Environment and Development Group at the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy. Uh, Maeve Powell, Kat Taylor, Anna Monero and I are the Reed Research Notes team. And we're really thrilled that um, for this special panel, we've had our colleagues Sarah Milne and Kuntala Lahiri Dut kindly put together today's panel. So in this webinar series, more broadly, we hold conversations with Reed researchers and the broader Reed research network and talk about current advances in research. We're recording the webinar and we'll make it available on the Reed website and also the Crawford School YouTube page. So the same goes for future and past webinars. Um, I suppose I should tell you who I am. <laughs> My name's Beck. I'm a lecturer here with the Resources, Environment and Development Group at the Crawford School of Public Policy. Um, I'm going to be facilitating the conversation today and we'll be exploring research in the time of COVID-19. So this covers research on COVID-19 and research on non-COVID-19 topics while navigating the impacts of the pandemic. So in this way, we explore personal and institutional challenges and successes. We hope that this webinar will create a space to start sharing experiences, learning from each other and thinking about what does research mean and look like in these very changed conditions? We're going to hear from five excellent panelists. We've got Dr. Sarah Milne, Professor Kuntala Lahiri Dut, Dr. Kat Taylor, Associate Professor John McCarthy, and Dr. Kirsty Jones. So each will provide opening remarks of about five minutes each. And after we've heard from everybody, we'll have time for Q&A and discussion. So I'll introduce everyone before their contribution and we'll start with Sarah in a moment. Now, please share your questions and comments with us. I'd also like to hear about your experiences, um, if you're willing and open to share. But I ask that in the Zoom webinar that you use the Q&A function if you can. So the chat is there and please use it, connect with each other. Um, but note whether you're chatting just to the panelists, which will come only to us that you can see on the screen, um, or if it's to all attendees and everyone in the audience will be able to see it too. But if it's something that you'd really like us to enter into conversation with during the Q&A, please use that Q&A function in Zoom webinar because we might not be able to keep up with both spaces. Um, I'd also just like to note that anything in the chat and the Q&A will be visible to at least the panel and probably all attendees. So while we of course welcome questions and contributions, we ask that you be respectful and constructive in what you put forward. So we'll start by hearing from Sarah. Sarah's going to um, share some experiences from master's level research students that have completed projects this year. And Sarah is also going to talk a little bit about the rationale for putting together this panel. Um, Sarah is a senior lecturer with the Resources, Environment and Development Program here at Crawford. So Sarah, I'll ask you to unmute yourself and get started. Thank you. 
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Beck, for the great introduction to our panel. Um, as Beck said, I'll just talk a little bit about how this panel came about. Um, and really, it's a product of a conversation that started during the Research and Impact Committee meeting um, at the Crawford School, our most recent one, so which was chaired by Associate Professor Bjorn Dressel. So dare I say, it was one of those moments when a committee meeting suddenly became really exciting and really interesting. And basically we were having a conversation about how to support researchers in the Crawford School to prepare research grants and also how to support um, PhD students in thinking through their fieldwork plans. And so the question was raised, you know, how do you do research when we have lockdowns, travel restrictions, border closures and more? What does data collection look like? Um, so obviously for those of us who are accustomed to doing work in the Asia Pacific region, this has been a really profound challenge and it's actually quite confronting. I think it confronts the hubris of the Northern researcher who jumps on an aeroplane every few months. Um, and many of us were sort of dealing with this challenge at the time. Um, so this prompted a conversation in the research committee. Um, and for me, I raised the experiences of, of the master's students who I've been working with over the last six months. Um, all of them are doing qualitative ethnographic work when they had all intended to travel to their field sites in the middle of the year to conduct empirical work and then to write up a research project. And so there we were as the research committee reflecting upon these experiences and Kuntala piped up and said, yes, we need to do a webinar about this because Kuntala had seen the master's students presenting their work in November. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about what these students um, achieved. I had five of these students and they're all in the research stream of the environmental management and development master's course here at the Crawford School. And as I said, all of them were planning to travel to conduct field work. And this was particularly the case for four of the master's students who were going to go to South Asia. One was to do work in Pakistan and the other three were to do work in Bangladesh. Um, and I guess the unique dynamic in this case is that in particular for the Bangladeshi students, they're, they, they're Bangladeshi nationals, they're international students who are sort of seconded from their normal work in Bangladesh here at the Crawford School doing research. So that placed them in a really unique position. Um, although they couldn't go home to do their work, they had local contacts and relationships that they could draw from. And so that really enabled them to respond to the challenge and to redesign their research really at the last minute. Um, so we sort of imagine at the beginning of semester two, we had to regroup and redesign and rethink. So let me just reflect upon what this research redesign process looks like. And then I'll head over to the next um, panelist. Basically the local connections and local relationships came into play in a massive way. And of course, language skills and ethnicity became a chief asset. Um, so for those who were doing the research in Bangladesh, two of them are normally government staff in Bangladesh and the other one is a university lecturer in Bangladesh. So they were all able to reach out to the local context. Um, and so in this context, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Zoom and all the other things we've become so familiar with, all of these digital platforms became vital tools and especially for sharing photographs and recordings and files. And the student's ability to speak Urdu and Bangla was also a core asset because it meant that they could very quickly access local media and sources in the local language and translate those sources themselves in, in the short amount of time that was available. Um, Luck also played a major role in the redesign and in the ability to achieve research outcomes. So in this case, I'll talk about um, Zarin Chaiti, who is, who is the student who's from Bangladesh and who works at the university. She was feeling a bit desperate. She was doing work about women's experiences on the Tista River in Bangladesh. 
um, and she was thinking she would have to redesign it completely and not do any field work at all. But she put out a last minute note on Facebook. Is anybody there? Is anybody in the field? And out of the woodwork came two of her former students who lived in the area. And because the country was in partial lockdown, she had to work with people from the area. She couldn't hire someone from the capital city. No one could do this. You couldn't hire a remote research assistant. You had to work with people really in the very local area. So remarkably, her former students volunteered for her and conducted some really remarkable research interviews. And I think um, it really shows the richness that can come out of pre-existing relationships local connections and working with collaborators who speak the local dialect and who are from the place. So in her case, it really enhanced this place-based research practice, but which is also remote. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great example. Um, yeah, so basically I would say that the dynamic of localization has been really emphasized by the new constraints of COVID. And I think that this is a kind of surprise benefit. Um, it empowers local researchers, it demands local lang language skills and relationships, um, and it really shakes up our usual, usual research behaviors, um, which I think is a good thing. And I think many of the students who I taught in the research masters course um, are in the room now. so. I would ask them afterwards to jump in and add to what I've said. It's very, very brief. Um, please correct me that with that, I'll hand over to Kuntala. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. That was really interesting. You've already raised some great points that hopefully we can dig into in the Q&A time. So it's now a great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Kuntala Lahiri Dut from um, the Resources, Environment and Development Program here at Crawford School. And Kuntala is going to speak with us about um, remote research and the potential for decolonial dynamics in the context of what COVID has reshaped in the research space. So please go ahead, Kuntala. Thank you for inviting me to speak in this important webinar. I realize that I'm sitting on a Nanawal and Nambri land that was never ceded. So in this webinar, I argue that we need a rethinking of fieldwork to enable a radical overhaul of research. We need a more thoughtful, collegial, and feminist approach in our research to build academic leadership as its end goal, academic scholarship as its end goal. I make these comments in light of the fact that globally, the shift of universities towards neoliberalization has made our research utilitarian. The pandemic travel restrictions amplified the deficiency of our research methods and illuminated that what we are discussing today is a unique problem of researchers who are based in the global north, that we are now expected to do quick fly in, fly out research in the global south. Our dealing with the problem will depend on our definition. Research fieldwork beyond COVID must involve a thinking about the source of the present problem, not travel bans, but the architecture of contemporary university education. The task is urgent because of the scale, speed, and global reach of the pandemic emerging within unprecedented global inequality. We must not resort to statements like Never let a serious crisis go to waste. At this juncture, when the crisis had, has magnified institutional deficiencies, it will not be business as usual and progressive education reform is not guaranteed. In contemporary higher education, the opportunity narrative heightens managerial, technocratic and masculinized views of crisis. It overshadows the moot point that the pandemic has prized open some of the larger ethical challenges to the way scholars 
carry out their research, the time pressures we subject ourselves to, the performance matrix that have pushed us to publish or perish, and to build an electronic footprint that alone can claim scholarly merit. Feminist scholars such as Catherine Karkov critiques the culture of audit and metrics, mass digitization and accountability as opposed to responsibility or citizenship that has now occupied universities of the global north. In a book titled Slow Scholarship, she shows how a growing bureaucracy limits the time available for shared research. Ironically, it is not our research per se, but this speed culture in research that is now threatened by the pandemic. Let me cite an example. What did I do? Unable to travel during the peak of the COVID crisis, with my Indian colleagues, I created a rapid phone appraisal tool to analyze the impact of the lockdown on women in remote rural areas and slums around stone quarries in India. What made this research method possible and successful? Looking back, it was my long association with these women developed over years during which I never left them behind as I moved along, along in my academic journey. In conclusion, I would remind that in the history of humankind, research was certainly not ever as fast as it has been turned into now. We do not need to that expressway of research a super fast lane that was undesirable and harmful to scholarship. The researcher, in my view, is at once a scholar and a custodian and becomes en route the more, you know, that more, the more difficult and slower path, the keeper of this knowledge bank. As researchers, we now need to work together across disciplines and at and across the global north and south, so as not to limit the other as mere sources of data or subjects of research. Let us together reimagine fieldwork, heed to feminist calls for slow scholarship, and reintroduce an ethics of care into our research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kuntala. And once again, so much to talk about and a very inspiring talk that you shared with us. Thank you very much. Um, it's now a great pleasure as well to introduce Dr. Kat Taylor. So Kat is a research fellow with the Water Justice Hub and also connected here with us in the Resources Environment and Development Program at the Crawford School. So Kat's going to talk about developing collaborations with Indigenous communities in the Kimberley. Please go ahead, Kat. Thank you. And we can see your screen looking good. Thanks. Ah, great. Thanks. Is that all right that I'm sharing that, uh, that screen? Sorry, just a moment. Um, thanks so much for the introduction and for that, that wonderful talk. Just wanted to acknowledge that I'm talking to you from Broome and acknowledge Yaru country and Yaru traditional owners and people. Uh, when I was asked to join this panel and thank you very much for the invitation I just started thinking what I often think which is what, what do we even mean by field work where is this place that we call the field where is the academy and um, that's a recognition that in participatory and collaborative modes of research knowledge is brought together and co-constructed in a lot of different locations not just the university so um, where I am now is at Kimberley in Western Australia. And this is a map of language groups in the area. And what's, I guess, important and significant about Western Australia is we've actually um, been very lucky around COVID. There hasn't been much community spread. And although there was an initial lockdown period, since then we've been able to travel quite freely uh, within the state um, with some 
exceptions. And I really want to uh, applaud the actions of Indigenous health organisations in leading the way. This has really been a huge Australian success story in fighting COVID. So the research project that I'm working on at the moment is a laureate research project under my supervisor, Quinton. It just started in July of this year. We do have an international team, but I guess uh, what's significant in this instance is at the moment we are discussing with the Matawara of Fitzroy River Council of um, traditional owners to form a research partnership and we're just scoping up and discussing what will the research be like within the sort of broad themes of water valuation and decision making. So of course before COVID we had a plan and of course once COVID hit the plan had to be changed a little bit and the key things, of course, were um, just being responsive. Initially, there was a lot of cancelling meetings and taking time and allowing time was really important, not travelling when that was not okay. For me, um, I was already kind of in the field when I got the job. I was in Broome, which is quite close, uh, relatively speaking, to the Fitzroy River. So rather than moving to Canberra, I just stayed here. And I was, um, feel very lucky to be able to do so. And likewise, my colleague, Anna Monero has been in Perth and she's been able to travel up here from time to time. So um, with COVID, we've had some online meetings. There's been some events where Anna and I have attended in person, such as this event in Fitzroy Crossing and Quinton has uh, made a short video and attended that way. And when it was safe and restrictions allowed, there were some um, in-person meetings, but again, up to the council as to what they, where they wanted to go with that. And also, of course, I've kept in touch with people at ANU. So um, I guess the approach has been here when we're doing these um, initial discussions and dialogues is to follow the lead of Indigenous organisations, to be adaptable, to be um, flexible about where the researchers are located. To, uh, we've changed our, some of our communication processes and the technology we've used. And of course, in Western Australia, we've just been in a very good situation. So I guess what I have been reflecting about this so far is that COVID-19 is, is a disruption to, to research. And it has moved, in many cases, researchers out of the physical academy um, of the university and into their homes. But in the case of this project, it has moved the researcher closer to what we might call the field. And this can present an opportunity to potentially change the dynamics of um, fly in, fly out research that we we're hearing about before. So um, thanks so much. Oh yes, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge again the Matawara Council and also my, my team as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kat, for sharing such a fascinating talk. And um, it's really interesting to see some of those practical adaptations that you've done as well. So I'll now um, introduce our fourth panelist, Associate Professor John McCarthy. John's with the Resources Environment and Development Program at the Crawford School as well. And John's gonna talk about researching COVID related impacts on food security in Indonesia. So this is doing research on COVID um, while being affected by the impacts of COVID. So John, please go ahead. Uh, okay, thanks uh, Beck and everyone. Can you see uh, this? Um, okay, so I was asked um, in the middle of the, we had a lockdown here in Canberra and in the middle of the lockdown or just before it, I was asked by ASIA, which is the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research to do um, an assessment as part of this um, project we had, which was meant to happen over one month, which was to assess the impact of COVID-19 on food systems in the Indo-Pacific. So this is exactly what Kuntala was talking about, incredibly fast research and um, very challenging. Um, so um, you can see here the, um, the head of ASIA who, who launched it just about two weeks ago. But what I had responsible for was for leading the Indonesian um, chapter of the project. And initially it was presented to me as a task that I would do in a month, but I, I 
decided it was uh, very too challenging to do a proper job in one month. Um, so what I did was I um, contacted a lot of my friends and colleagues in Indonesia um, and together we did it. Um, and fortunately, in one, one of the things that someone in ACR said was that um, this is really how we should be doing research with our colleagues very intensively co-producing knowledge in, um, in a quite um, interesting way. And um, I've, over the course of my research career, I've been moving in this direction because I like working with people and I have a lot of friends in Indonesia that I've accumulated over the years. So um, what we ended up doing was they were all very busy and very reluctant to be involved and there was limited funding. So it was very challenging to kind of engage them. But over time, we were able to do this and they made a, a great contribution. And in fact, um, Henry Satoris from the University of North Sumatra came up with this idea of a, a survey through WhatsApp. So we made use of both my own networks, um, SCR networks, and the um, networks of these four uh, researchers. And we were even able to get information from Indonesia's remote province of um, Papua, where uh, Vanya had been working previously. Um, so I guess just to reflect on what we might have learned through this, I'll just stop sharing screen. Um, and uh, Sarah suggested I might respond to a few questions here. So um, just by way of it, what might be some of the, the lessons from this, I guess. Uh, I'd like probably, I think most of the points have been made by Kuntala, Sarah and, um, and, uh, and Kat. Um, I think what I found was try, trying to get information and trying to answer some research questions under a very challenging situation was really stretched me, but I think it was really useful and really a positive learning experience. Um, I think because of the nature of the challenge of COVID and the fact that everybody is shocked by the depth of the problem, everyone kind of were very, people were very collaborative um, and we all made the best of our networks and tried to get things done in the context. Um, so the strategy of Zoom interviews with about 20 people over about three weeks was very stressful. Um, the use of the analyzing the WhatsApp data from about 100 people across Indonesia was also quite time consuming and challenging, but we were able to stitch together quite a comprehensive story. Um, I guess, uh, there were new dynamics in this process in that it was really a co-learning um, thing, I think, for, and we were all very engaged, ringing up all a lot of contacts I had in rural Indonesia as well and interviewing them. So it was, um, it was a very enriching experience, but quite shocking in some respects in that, you know, we, it was confronting to, to talk to people in rural Indonesia in the middle of the COVID epidemic. Um, so I think the, the, there were very different dynamics to where, where our usual form of research. Um, and definitely the COVID process has really shaped what we might do in this context. So I guess um, I'd be happy to discuss with anyone if they have any questions about how this worked out, but I guess that's my overall reflections. It was a very rich experience, incredibly challenging. I think I needed a, a holiday after it um, because the timeline was, as Kotala said about fast research, it is very problematic and I agree with, entirely with her that research models need to be rethought. And um, as researchers, we often face challenging timelines, but we do have to take into account that this was kind of almost an emergency situation and policymakers do need um, data and material to make their policy. And they wanted to get information as quickly as possible. So that's why we had to, to really um, take on board a very, very stressful sort of timeline. Um, so I guess that's all I'd like to say. Happy to answer questions. It's very hard to um, reflect on these experiences because they're still quite fresh in my mind. So look forward to discussing it maybe in the question and answers. Thank you very much, John. It's an incredible story and also a really interesting um, sort of Timeline contrast, as you highlighted as well with the points Kuntala was making earlier. So there's lots that we can explore there shortly. Um, but for now, it's very nice to be introducing Dr. Kirsty Jones. 
At Cresty is the Knowledge Translation Lead and a primary researcher for the Next Generation Engagement Program. Um, she's based with us at the Crawford School of Public Policy and Kirsty is going to be speaking about new research approaches under COVID restrictions in Australia. So Kirsty, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks Beck and thanks for having me along today. Um, I'm here in Melbourne so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I stand on which is the Boomerang people. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. So yeah, I'm um, a researcher with the Next Gen program, which looks at the role that community engagement plays for infrastructure delivery here in Australia. And over the last couple of years, we've been working hand in hand with industry to co-design a framework which, out, um, which sets out the standards for engagement excellence. And it's really been a collaborative piece of work which where we've um, co-produced the work with community engagement professionals to really understand what engagement um, entails and how to get the best out of your community engagement to optimize project performance and most importantly outcomes for community members. So at the start of this year we wanted to work um, with those outside of the community engagement space, working with engineers and project managers, procurement officers to really get their input into what community engagement means to them and how a set of standards would help their work. And so we had a travel budget to allow us to go and visit Queensland and New South Wales, work here in Melbourne to go and sit down and run workshops with those, um, that group of professionals. And of course, when COVID-19 struck, those workshops were no longer um, possible and so like the others we had to move to the zoom platform and as john said it's really stressful so, you know trying to conduct meetings when um, you're trying to get that rich quality data to try and get understandings of people's thoughts and their insights and feedback when it's impossible to really read the room that um, it's really difficult to get those nonverbal cues and so it was a real challenge that to, to grapple with, to make the most of these people's time, um, which is obviously very valuable to them, um, and to, to think about how we could structure those Zoom meetings in a way where we could all get a lot out of it. And I think one of the, the reflections that we have is, um, while that was really challenging to, to set up those meetings, what it has allowed us to do is conduct more meetings. And we've been able to get a real richness of data because we haven't had to travel up <laughs> Um, across the country to be able to do those meetings and we've been able to meet with people who we previously wouldn't have been able to access so that has been really valuable but another um, component of my work is that as I said before we work very collaboratively with industry um, with the view of industry implementing the the tools and the products that we're able to generate from our research and a really key component um, to that implementation and thinking about the future impact of our work is something that I think has been reflected in everybody's discussions today, which is relationships. And when um, you, you can't have those face-to-face -face meetings and you're forced into this situation of, of meeting online, it really does put a pressure on how to maintain relationships, but also to initiate relationships where you haven't met face-to-face -face in the first place. And um, I've been really fortunate in my work that I've worked um, in a co-location role, so I've actually had a desk at one of our industry partners, Melbourne Water, where I've been fortunate enough to, to build friendships with the people there um, to be able to really think through um, how our research can use. So it, it's not just a, um, working with colleagues and working with, um, with industry from a research basis, but it's also that friendship that we've been able to, to, to develop over, over the years and um, to lose that um, and or to rethink how we 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 maintain those relationships has been um, interesting. But going forward next year, one of the big challenges I have is that I've got to be co-located now with the Victorian government, and that co-location can't actually exist in the sense that I'm not going to have that desk space. But we are working collaboratively on a project with them. So how can we work hand in hand with people we've never met? How are we going to be able to initiate those relationships to, to forge that trust that is, is so important for, for co-production research to be able to take place? So I think this year has um, been one where it, it's made us rethink how the role of travel, as the others have suggested, and, and how we can make use of the online platforms. But also it's a reminder of, of the importance of, of relationships and how we go about maintaining them. 
thank you very much, Kirsty, and thank you to everybody for your wonderful contributions. Um, Kirsty, you've ended us on. So, sorry, my microphone keeps popping off my shirt here. You've ended us on such a excellent topic, the topic of relationships, which is a thread that's really woven through many of the um, presentations that we've heard and relates to a couple of the questions that have come through in the Q&A. So I'm going to take a couple of the questions together. So one of the questioners asks, I want to ask how they, sorry, that's not the one I was looking at. Here we go. Thank you all for your initiative in organizing this panel discussion. Sarah, I'm interested in the very different positions Australian locals and internationals, nationals of the country of their intended fieldwork locations, find themselves in. Of course, internationals would tend to have greater breadth of social connections and they, they could use to run their research remotely. I'm wondering across the students, and all panelists, how many, sorry, I'm jumbling up some of the words here, how many don't have the breadth of social connections themselves or one step removed, for example, their supervisor's contacts, and how many would benefit if restrictions on movement continue from an external resource offering research support and packages to provide these networks and run their research remotely for them in specific countries. In other words, is the current social capital adequate or do we need to do more to help students run their field work in this brave new world? And that's connected to um, another question that's touched on the same theme. How do students who do not have established relationships in the field, in quotation marks, conduct research? Does one have to rethink the proposal? So um, given that first question, Stopped in you by name, Sarah, I might go to you first. So the, the theme that it would be great to hear some reflections on is the nature of relationships. How do you go about doing research if you don't yet have those relationships? And what do we do um, to foster the relationships to support effective research? So Sarah, if you'd like to share some comments and then I'd like to invite everybody else to unmute yourselves and contribute when Sarah's wrapped up. Okay, thanks Beck. These are really important questions because um, it's going to affect research practice, certainly in years to come. Um, there's no substitute for relationships. There's no substitute for local access. I don't think you can outsource or delegate very easily necessarily, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to find ways to build relationships and collaborate, as Kirsty was saying, on starting, you know, really starting from scratch and initiating new collaborations online. I think it's a brave new world. It's a brave new frontier. We have to try. Um, but, but that said, yeah, drawing from existing relationships and existing capacities, um, it forces us to really look close, closely at what is in country. So I've been talking, for example, to an honours student who I will supervise next year. Her research plan was to go to Myanmar and look at resource extraction in Myanmar, but she probably won't go there now. So the idea will be to build research collaborations remotely. Um, and I think there's a silver lining because as I was saying, it empowers local researchers to play a bigger role and, and it's much more about co-production. And, and you can do that when supervisors have relationships and contacts in country. Um, I think it is a lot about social capital. Um, that said, some people will be redesigning research and in a couple of the cases of my master's students um, this semester, they worked with a lot of open access and publicly available online sources. So my Australian student um, discovered a huge public database with lots of documents in the public domain. And so he did a lot of his analysis focused upon what was in the documents um, along with Zoom interviews. And another student did a lot of media analysis looking at um, newspaper narratives. So, so yeah, it does imply some changes to research design. Um, I don't know, that's probably enough said. Kuntala, I don't know if you're raising your hand. No, I wasn't raising my hand, but really I, I, I think you have spoken really well and addressed the problem. The point is that we cannot think that the way we did the research, you know, before is all really good and we will go back as soon as this is over, we will go back to that or this is a temporary situation, we will tide over this. I think this is 
if at all it is an opportunity, it is an opportunity or an in, in call for us to think about, you know, this fly in fly out research, the express way of research that I was talking about. I think there is no question of, uh, you know, us as researchers seeing this as our, you know, our uh, opportunity or a, or a great need to move away from that. So three and a half years of research nowadays in the universities, that really got to stop. Three and a half years, you go in and you utilize people, that utilitarian perspective, you know, and go in that field and do your things and then come back and write a great paper and, you know, then become this well-known uh, social scientist who has the ultimate, you know, say about things. That's something that got to stop that if we can understand that, then that's the basic premise and then we can build on the, there. That's what I, I mean, there is no dearth, as you heard, there's no dearth of data. We can mine data, WhatsApp, what goes on on the Facebook, what the WhatsApp groups talk about, how people interact in Zooms, even that can be treated as data, depends. So how do we generate the primary data or do we just, mine the existing uh, primary data that people are generating, all these can be thought through, you know, in a, in a second stage. So first we need to understand that the, the, that is undesirable. The way we did things was undesirable. And, you know, this is a great, uh, you know, call to us to, and, and Sarah nicely, you have said that not only just turn into turn towards slow, uh, scholarship, but also decarbonize our research. Um, I just add something very quickly, just building on both those two perspectives. I guess if you've got to do research, we have to be really practical. And I think what Sarah and Kutala are saying is suggests that we try and triangulate between texts we can get, newspaper, journal articles, whatever, project documents, and then we can also try and uh, look at YouTubes and the, these webinars that are everywhere. Um, and then we can do a limited number of interviews probably on, um, on Zoom, but there's going to be limitations. And for sure, we can use networks that we can get to, we, can, we have access to, to access people. So I think it's still possible to do research. Your project will probably have to be redesigned. Um, but I still think it's important to do research. And I still think that trying to master if you're working in the Asia Pacific or even in indigenous communities, it's really critical to try and get some language skills. I'm very different here to a lot of my quantitative colleagues. I just think we can crunch numbers, but I really think knowledge is contextual and we really do need to understand how it's embedded in local ways of being, how people eat, how they think. You know, if you, if you interview them in, the kit, in their kitchen, you're going to get a very different perspective than if you do this kind of, formal survey with our pre, I'm not saying quantitative research isn't important, but I think we need to also break down this idea that we can just crunch numbers and get information. Okay, so that's my 10 cents worth. Thanks, John. And Kirsty and Kat, would you like to add any comments onto this theme? Oh, I, mean, I was just gonna say, just, um, just another point around, uh, I, I don't think it's just thinking about redesigning um, the research, but it's also thinking about the knowledge translation aspects. Um, so for, for our work, it's, we're always thinking about um, how our work will be used and how it will be utilised and how we can support governments and industry um, to adopt any of the tools that we're using. And the, we really, really do have to rethink um, how we go about that in an age where that in-person contact um, is not always already available and rethinking um, what relationships are and, and again, how we can initiate them and maintain them. I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you very much. We've got quite a lot of um, very rich and interesting questions coming through. So I'm hoping we can get across all of them and I might invite everybody, if you feel it's possible, if you provide relatively short responses, we might be able to hear from everyone and get across quite a few of the remaining topics. So one of the other questions that kind of builds on from what we've just been hearing, 
reads, great talks, everybody. Thanks so much for your valuable insights. It's so nice how everyone's always so, anyway, that's very lovely. Keen to hear insight from all of you. Do you think some of the new adaptations of this kind of field work would or should continue into the future? In other words, is the future of field work going to be a combination of online and offline approaches? Thanks. So um, perhaps Kirsty and Kat, I might ask you two to start us off and then I'd like everybody else to contribute. Um, I think what's been the uh, silver lining of the pandemic is that we're all making better use of online tools. And I guess as a West Australian for me, that's been fantastic that now I can um, access seminars and talks from all, all around the world in a way that I couldn't before, uh, or at least not so easily. And I think that that will happen in field work as well. And I know this um, panel has concentrated on field work, but I, I guess field work is um, part of the broader ways we, we think about research and sort of some, you know, just this continual questioning of like, what is research and who is it for? The answer to that will um, show the direction for the fieldwork it's, itself. Um, but yeah, I, I think that certainly the more, now that we've been, we've been forced to become much more comfortable with these online tools, that's hugely helpful. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just I would agree with that. I think it's about finding um, when it's appropriate to be able to do online. Then it's it really has forced us to think about how to, to work in that space. And I mean, I think from a, from a budget perspective that we'll be able to do much more work and be able to reach more and engage with more people now that we have these online tools available to us. And there'll be times when those meetings in person are, are the appropriate and they're right for what we're trying to achieve. So I, I think it's, it's forced us to innovate and forced us to rethink about how we approach um, how we conduct our research. And I think going forward, it will be about thinking about how to apply those, um, those new approaches where it's appropriate. Thank you. Uh, thanks for just uh, letting me comment. I can't help but rem you know, remember uh, a great poem that I read long time ago. It's written by Bikram Seth, the Indo-Anglian uh, author who's uh, more famous for The Suitable Boy, which is now you know, being shown on Netflix, that tome-like book, a fiction. But he went to Stanford University from India, went to do his PhD. And his PhD was on, you know, on rural China. So he went to a remote village in Jiangsu province. And he had all these questionnaires and tape recorders and all that. And he was talking to this um, old woman uh, and after finishing the questionnaire he put down the rec tape recorder and the questionnaire and started chatting with that old woman and then during the conversation the old woman told him that my parents th they were so poor that they sold me into marriage in this village and he was stunned and he realized that nothing that he had had in his questionnaire or could prepare him for that answer. He was so stunned. He actually quit his PhD studies and he wrote a poem. If you Google it, you will find it. His name is Bikram Seth and the name of the poem is Research in Jiangsu Province. And <laughs> it is worth a read. You know, it is, that, that, that would tell you what I'm trying to talk about really today. Thanks. Please go ahead, Sarah. Thank you, Quintala. Thank you for mentioning that because it kind of segues into, I think, a dimension of this conversation which we haven't yet got to in the discussion, which is ethics. And I can see in the chat and in the Q&A a few questions about, you know, how do you get your ethics approval? Um, so there's the mechanics of getting an ethics approval, but then there's also the ethical dimensions of extractive research and being in a place and sharing with people. 
the ethics of care that Kuntala mentioned, and that extends to care for the planet, which is not catching aeroplanes and not emitting huge amounts of carbon associated with research practice. So there's a kind of broader ethical set of considerations. Um, but in terms of the mechanics, and I just wanted to respond really quickly to some of the questions about how did the master's students get ethics approval um, and how does it work when you're dealing with social media? I think there's probably a whole suite of new questions arising there. In very practical terms, the master's students this semester um, wrote ethics applications. They had written in already to engage research assistants. Um, some of them, they were already able to name the research assistants, so they built it into the research and had the, the usual protocols that would come with conducting um, field work. The data were not being collected from Facebook necessarily. Facebook was being used as a tool to reach out to people and locate people for subsequent conversations. But I, I don't know, there is a separate will be protocols around data that comes on Facebook. I don't, I don't really know. I can't answer that question. Somebody here might be able to answer that. Um, John talked about using YouTube as, as also another data source. Um, so ethics and digital sources um, is, a, I think, a hanging question there. But there is an ethics, there are, there are ethical questions that arise when you're not personally there to witness how your research assistants conduct themselves in the field and how all of that plays out. All of the contextual data, you suddenly lose it. And, and so for all of the silver linings of, of working collaboratively with local research assistants when you're not personally there, I think it does leave questions hanging. So there are no easy answers, but I'm really glad we're talking about it. I could just jump in there. I, I think one of the main issues I always find with using local researchers is they don't always res, uh, respect the confidentiality of interviews um, because it mightn't be part of their day-to-day -day practice. So usually there's a training process one goes through in inducting your co-researchers into the requirements of our ethics committees. So that, that would be one thing that really would need to be flagged, I think. Um, I, the problem, I think, with gaining access to information is that the conclusions of this discussion today are really that there's a relational aspect to research. But by that, I mean, without good social relationships, you don't get good research generally. So this is the major challenge of doing more applied fieldwork based research in the COVID period. So it's not easy to substitute that and we're not I don't think we should say that it's possible to totally substitute it it's basically not so it's going to involve a lot of people probably redesigning their research projects I think um, it, and that's not necessarily a bad thing it might open up some uh, projects that people haven't thought about doing because everyone likes to go to the field but there are a lot of things that can be done through reviewing things that are available otherwise. So there's a silver lining, but you know, let's be honest about it, it's not optimal. I know there are some people that are going to take leave next year to wait for 2023, hoping that pandemic might be, um, have died down by then. So, you know, I mean, let's, to be honest, my heart goes out to PhD students. I think it's a really tough time and I really feel sorry for them. So I don't think we should pretend that it's easy, um, but you know, um, we are in a privileged position here in Australia compared to many places. And that's really came home to me when I was doing Zooms uh, into rural Indonesia. Um, so, you know, it, it's, let's not um, gild the lily. I won't say anything more on that. Pass on to you, Beck. Thank you very much, John. And thanks, Sarah, for raising the ethics questions as well. And I can see John's been also providing written comments in response to many of the questions. So I think you can all interact in that Q&A space and see the responses there. But given the time, I think now might be a, a nice time to invite everybody on the panel to make perhaps a 30 second remark. It, it might be raising a theme that hasn't come up or highlighting some of these um, threads that are woven throughout all of these different aspects of the conversation as John has just done, um, and then we'll close the session. So, um, I'm not sure. I feel like I need to play favourites and invite somebody to go first, but I don't want to do that. So I might just ask you each to unmute yourselves and speak um, when there's a, a break and try to keep it to about 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, 
I just want to echo what John said about PhD students. Like this it has been a really challenging year. It is really challenging and um, just um, PhD students, like be, be good to yourselves, look after your mental health. And, you know, we understand that this is a really difficult time. So I don't want to um, <laughs> diminish that or, or anything like that. So um, keep going. On that note, can I jump in just to also acknowledge Kirsty that we had a conversation before this panel happened about how so much of Kirsty's research was conducted from lockdown in Melbourne, so being at home with young children. So there's a really, you might want to speak to that Kirsty, but there's a very, there's a gender dimension that comes here as well. Yeah. I <laughs> I, mean, I was going to say that in terms of self-care, I think that's for everyone. This, having worked in lockdown in Melbourne over the last um, year, it's it's been a really a challenging time. And I think, you know, while we're all used to, or more used to children popping into the meetings that we have, there is a, there's a real pressure in terms of um, doing that, um, trying to maintain your professionalism within a meeting while also parenting and also feeling like you're being judged in that moment by how you parent. And it's a really difficult um, situation that I never imagined. Um, I, I didn't feel that pressure of, I didn't imagine there to be that pressure of I would have work colleagues suddenly see how I was as a mother, as well as then having to jump back into a very, you know, interesting conversation with the Victorian government as my daughter's come in and complained about the Peppa Pig episode. So it's situations that I, I hadn't ever imagined that we'd be in. And I think being kind to yourself and recognizing that everybody is in that position um, has been a really important component of this year to um, that. Um, yeah, it's just one that we, I don't think at the start of the year we could have ever predicted. So um, giving yourself a pat on the back is a really, really important, I think. Yeah. Thanks, Kirsty. Quintala and John, would you like to make some concluding remarks? Thank you. Thank you. I was just typing uh, my uh, uh, response to somebody in who is uh, wanting to go to Thailand next year and, uh, and is wondering whether she should take leave, you know, and I think there is a, uh, you know, again, she, th this person has not started research yet. And I think when you decide on a research, field of research, you know, sort of kind of addresses the questions Kat put forth in her first slide. Where is the field? Where is the academy? You know, the academy is here and the field is out there. You know, it, how do we kind of blur the boundaries between the two? There is a need to do that as came through from all the presentations, but how do you do that? And it, your name is Zala, I think you Zali, yeah. Yeah. And look, uh, if you, if, why did you choose Thailand? There must be a reason. You must have had some contacts. You know, you tap into those contacts. If you have not built those contacts, now, now is the time to build them. Start building them. You know, the example that Sarah gave of Zarin Chaiti, she reached out on Facebook. Maybe you will get contacts uh, in, at the local level. So these are the things that you can uh, consider. Uh, there is no straightforward, simple answer, but I think there's a great need now to rethink these three and a half years, PhD, you know, immense pressure on researchers to just go do something and publish and so on. So that's, that's certainly, that should be on the agenda in the, not just the, how do we get the ethical, ethics approval, which is a, an important issue, but very utilitarian. That takes the business as usual approach. And how do we kind of upset the curve and think about different ways of doing research? That would be a primary objective, I would hope so. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, I'll just make one brief comment, just building on what Kotala said. I, I've always tried to build in an element of serendipity to my research, by that I mean, if something doesn't work, or if something does work in a way I was that I didn't expect, I build my, I change my research project. 
And I've done that several times. In fact, sometimes it's made my research much more interesting. So maybe you think have to think about this a little bit uh, in those terms. Okay, now a problem's come. You can resist the problem and get very upset about it and fume about it. Or you can think, well, how am I going to make use, you know, surf with the problem rather than swim against the tide? And I think that's what Kuntalo is, uh, is doing. So maybe if you're working on Thailand, maybe it might be a chance to learn Thai for a year, or maybe it, you could defer your study for a year, or you could work out, do I really want to do field work or would I be better doing a, a, a thesis based on a literature review or using other available sources? So I think, you know, it's, it's confronting for all of us. We've all had to change with 2020. And um, so I just encourage you to be dynamic and try and think about it in a positive way. That, you know, maybe there's something you can do that's different or that's still exciting. You know, do something else for a year maybe and learn Thai in the meantime. I don't know. I don't mean to be flippant. I know it's difficult, but that's all I, I would like to say. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. And we'll wrap it up here. Thank you so much to our exceptional panel members for your very thoughtful contributions. And there's clearly a much um, deeper, longer conversation that we could be having if time permitted. So thanks to, to the Reed and Crawford teams for supporting the webinar series and also for um, Sarah and Kuntala for your special efforts with putting this panel together. Thanks for everybody who came along and contributing to the discussion, sharing your thoughtful questions too. Um, and you can always revisit your wonderful memories of this webinar when we've got it <laughs> online shortly. So do share it because we are learning how to surf with the problem as John put it so nicely. So thank you all very much and we'll close the session now. Take Thanks care. Beck. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's great. Very early on in the morning in India. Ah. <laughs> and WA. And WA, yeah. Not too bad. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you.